Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to our online forum for today, uh, Thinking with Augustine about social upheaval, Providence history, and the city of God. Really glad that you're here to join us uh, for this conversation. My name is Travis Pickell, and I'm the Associate Director of University Engagement at Anselm House, which is a Center for Christian Study at the University of Minnesota. Here at Anselm House, we strive to bring the Christian th theological tradition and humanist tradition into conversation with academic and intellectual life of the university and to support students and faculty in integrating faith with their work and their vocations in the university and beyond. And I'm really excited about today's discussion, which will give us an opportunity to discuss one of the truly great theologians with three world-class experts. It's hard to overstate the impact of Augustine of Hippo that he has had on not only the church's own theological doctrines, but also on how many of us in the modern West see and experience the world around us. We may not be aware of it at all times, but many of us inherit our understandings of history and political authority, friendship, desire, duty, and even the self to name a few to this late fourth century bishop. Today, we want to think with Augustine about the nature of social and political order and change. To say that this is a topic of importance for us today is an understatement, to say the least. Now, before I introduce our panelists, I'd like to invite everybody who's with us today to, um, to offer any questions for the Q&A period that we're going to hold at the end of our time. Uh, you can do that at any point during the program uh, through the Q&A button below, and feel free to interact at that point and vote for each other's questions and uh, do that at any point. Now, I'd love to go ahead and turn and introduce our panelists for today. We'll begin with Veronica roberts Obel, who is Assistant Professor of Philosophy at Assumption University in Massachusetts. Veronica writes broadly on Augustine's ethics and politics and has recently published Politics and the Earthly City in Augustine's City of God, which I had the delight of reading in preparation for today's event. Um, and that's a book which considers the status of politics within Augustine's sacramental worldview. So glad to have you with us, Veronica. Thank you, very happy to be here. Chuck Matthews is the Carolyn M. Barber Professor of Religious Studies at the University of Virginia and a senior fellow at UVA's Miller Center of Public Affairs. His books include Evil and the Augustinian Tradition, A Theology of Public Life, and The Republic of Grace, Augustinian Thoughts in Dark Times. He's currently at work on a volume entitled The Future of Political Theology. And if you like what he has to say today, you can also take his course on the city of God through the great courses online. Welcome, Chuck. Thanks for having me. And finally, Eric Gregory is professor of religion at Princeton University, where he's also the chair of the Council of the Humanities, director of the program in humanities and human humanistic studies and Stewart seminars in religion. And he sits with the executive committee of the University Center for Human Values. In addition to his many articles, Eric is the author of Politics and the Order of Love and Augustinian Ethic of Democratic Citizenship. And among his current projects is a book tentatively titled The Ingathering of Strangers, Global Justice and Political Theology, which examines secular and religious perspectives on global justice. Hi, Eric. Hi, Travis. Thanks for joining us and hosting us. Absolutely. I'm sorry I didn't get the message that we were reading Augustine in Honolulu with Charles Matthews with the Hawaiian <laughs> shirt, but I'll, I'll play the more austere uh, interpreter. Yes, we have something for everybody at Anselm House. Well, let me go ahead and start with you, Eric. Um, you know, we've this is this event is part of a series that we have called Thinking with the Saints. And um, in doing so, we were, as I mentioned before, trying to, you know, gather what we might from figures from the past and for our own time. Uh, and that's something that I think all three of the scholars on this panel exemplify in their work, uh, but also something which you've written directly about in your book, Politics and the Order of Love. Um, there you discuss different ways of engaging historical figures, uh, one of which you call rational reconstruction, which I think is a really useful way of thinking about 
thinking with figures from the past. So I wonder if just at this point, you could explain what rational reconstruction is and how it relates to other modes of scholarship and also help us understand what's involved in doing it well. Sure. Um, I think one of the, the, among many challenges facing the humanities today is, is sorting out the relationship between historical and normative thinking. This taps into long-standing debates about facts and values, the ethics of reading, what's sometimes called the new historicism, good old-fashioned historicism, but also generally, you know, what is the power of the humanities uh, to be an instrument of social change um, and personal transformation today? So I, I don't want to get deep into methodological weeds or disciplinary uh, food fights right now, but in a, in a general sense, Rational reconstruction is a way of doing philosophy or theology that imagines a conversation um, in what Richard Rorty called uh, the re-educated dead. In fact, I, I pick up the phrase rational reconstruction from an essay that Richard Rorty uh, wrote. So re-educating the dead is, is maybe something like um, imagining a, a heavenly seminar where we summon avatars of the past, uh, maybe on a Zoom panel, where we pretend like we can talk with figures from the past um, as if they're one of us. Um, Augustine didn't have the same view of progress that uh, Richard Rorty did, but I think Augustine actually forged this path by, by translating a lot of ancient philosophy um, into a theological idiom um, and in a dialogical way with a number of important figures. Now, albeit he often did so polemically, he sometimes did so charitably, but uh, rational reconstruction is this kind of sense that we can have a conversation um, with the past. And many people have done this today, secularizing Augustine, channeling his views maybe in the aftermath of 9-11 or during the Cold War, or um, finding in this pre-modern figure a guide to post-modernity and how to think about the inner life and the nature of love. Um, so thinking of Augustine as um, what you know, philosophers might call an epistemic peer, um, a, a famous French historian once likened Augustine to a hot jazz trumpeter that was improvising all the time. He's not systematic, he's not a classical musician, um, but he was always kind of in conversation. So Rorty contrasted rational reconstruction with historical reconstruction. And that focuses more on situating a thinker deeply in their own context often emphasizing how distant they are from us, how their vocabulary is different, their concerns are different, focusing on, say, the way in which Augustine is a particular kind of Platonist or a particular kind of African, a particular kind of Roman, uh, a particular kind of reader of Paul or a reader of the Psalms or the Hebrew prophets. So that might not sound very controversial, um, but I think there are dangers on both sides. Some historians get very nervous um, about anachronism when we bring our own interests to bear, um, as if we can read a text without context, or um, especially when there's a fear of a kind of false universality or invoking Augustine's authority for our own point of view. Um, at the other end, some philosophers question whether historical figures, especially distant ones like Augustine, have much to say to us. Um, intellectual history might be very interesting, they say, but not for, for thinking as it were. Um, one of my distinguished colleagues had a sign on his office door that read, just say no to the history of philosophy. Um, it was as if philosophy is a science, and in order to do good science today, you really don't need to know what the ancients thought about, uh, you know, where the sun was. Uh, in fact, it might be better not to know those things. So I think there are risks on both sides, especially with someone like Augustine. When I teach Augustine to undergrads, he casts such a long shadow, shaped so much of Christian thought, but as you mentioned, uh, many um, fields. Um, some of my undergraduates love or hate Augustine because they read him like a 21st century evangelical in Minnesota, um, as opposed to a fifth century North African Roman Catholic. Um, that can be a way into Augustine, but maybe not into a way of thinking with him. Some of my philosophy colleagues say, oh, that's super interesting what you have to say about Augustine's world, especially if you're challenging maybe a textbook image of him. But let's put that aside and now let's really talk about justice. Um, so my sense is a lot of people in Augustine studies mostly do historical reconstruction. He's one of the most studied figures, um, very learned people. I've learned a lot from them. 
Um, they make historical judgments about what Augustine thought in his lifetime in conversation with his interlocutors. Um, but I'm not a proper historian. I'm more of a constructive, normative thinker, um, thinking with the spirit of Augustine, maybe, uh, if not always the letter, so to speak. So I think it's important to track his core commitments and I think just to answer your question, I think the best we can do is just make explicit which task we're doing when. So not to conflate rational and historical reconstruction or the exegetical and the normative. It's sometimes hard to do because even I think historical reconstruction involves judgments and interpretations. Um, but um, one, one just brief thought, I think the history of Augustinianism has always been the history of Augustinianisms. Um, people, um, a series of people kind of parachuting into Augustine and finding something interesting, bringing it back to their world. And uh, this is kind of punctuated revival more than maybe a kind of long tradition of a commentary that you might find in Aristotelianism or Thomism even. This is a contrast that a, a, a philosopher Stephen Men has made. So I affirm this conviction that we can have meaningful conversations with figures in the past, with dead philosophers, dead theologians, uh, anyone. Um, his writing is strenuous. And when, when you read him, he wants to read you to read yourself, um, to kind of interrogate your own desires and the wounds. That's why he sounds so contemporary when we read him. Um, so getting to know Augustine is in some sense getting to know yourself. And that can be uh, liberating. Um, I think positively it means we're not alone with our thoughts. Um, we're not in our own silo. Um, and Augustine was convinced that images and words convey reality. Um, not completely and through a glass darkly, um, but I think a Christian might have more to say about this, maybe a theology of the theology of history, um, but maybe then maybe more to theorize that we can just perform it in this conversation. Great, that's super helpful, Eric. Um, I, and even for the whole panel, even when I do direct a question at one person, I want to invite anybody to sort of add on or, or respond. So Veronica or Chuck, if you have any other thoughts on rational reconstruction, please. I would just say that it seems to me what Eric said seems very true. I think that I, I would say my work tends to be more historical reconstruction, but uh, in immersing myself in his world, it still is a conversation, right? Um, I learn from him and then inevitably there is something that is that helps me understand the contemporary world. Um, even as I engage in that historical, and I think those those are very complementary projects, generally anyway. Yeah, that's that's really great. You know, um, I I hope that we can do a lot of rational reconstruction during this conversation about lots of different topics that we can think with Augustine about. But maybe that's a good transition to to maybe invite some historical reconstruction in terms of in order to set the stage for the rational reconstruction. Uh, I do think it would be really helpful to get a sense for Augustine in his own time um, and particularly about this uh, this topic of what I'm calling social upheaval uh, which has you know many different levels to it. Um, one of the things that struck me as I was thinking about Augustine in preparation for this event is that he was called both the first modern man by Adolf, Adolf von Harnack, uh, and then he was also called by many the, the sort of last great thinker of the classical era. Um, people have sort of pointed to him as sort of the end of an era of classic antiquity in, in some ways. And sort of however you think about the merits of those claims, it, it does point to the fact that he seems to be a person of living in a time of great transition, sort of historical transition epoch you know, division. Um, so I wonder, maybe start with Chuck, uh, but then others can add on, you know, what were some of the, the changes that Augustine was living through? Um, and in what ways did he experience this, what we might call social or cultural upheaval? Those are, those are great questions. Um, I, uh, and just to give the audience a, the, the, the truth here, uh, Travis did let us know he would be asking some of these questions. So I, I do have a, a reasonably detailed answer, but brief, I hope. Um, I would say actually there were four big transitions that Augustine's world and Augustine to some degree experienced. Although I think actually the most important transition might have come after Augustine's death. Uh, so that's an interesting fact about Augustine that uh, as I heard an historian once say, um, 
maybe the most important century for Augustine was the sixth century. <laughs> but let me say what I mean. First of all, the most obvious transition is the enormous political upheaval uh, of his world. Um, he was born in a reasonably stable fourth century empire that had seen a lot of instability in the third century, but then recovered and in some ways was going full steam in the fourth century. So North Africa was a very rich area of the Roman Empire, and it was a very successful area. It had its own um, divisions and conflicts, but it was a successful, successful world. And um, by the time he died, uh, Vandals, uh, a barbarian tribe which had lived beyond the Rhine in his time, in his youth, uh, Vandals were actually besieging the walls of the city that he was living in. So in terms of the political transformation, that's a very large one in some ways. Now, this is now what we think of as the end of the Western Empire. Augustine might not have thought of it that way. It's very complicated what that condition was like, but it was clear that things were changing in the West quite dramatically. A second transformation, I would say, and one that's less appreciated often, unless you get like deep in the weeds, um, uh, is the ecclesiastical transformation that Augustine experienced. We talk about the city of God as if the main thing that provokes it is the 410 sack of Rome. And that's absolutely right. But another very crucial thing happens in 411, and that is the Council of Carthage. And the Council of Carthage settles the nature of the Christian church in North Africa, by and large, after almost a century of big division. Um, there had been an entirely local church called that we typically call the Donatist Church, and then Augustine's, um, which we call the Catholic Church. Um, and over that century, they fought very viciously, sometimes quite bloodily. Um, in 411, finally, imperial authorities um, were cornered into stepping in, and Augustine's side won. So Augustine, after 411, was um, also working on trying to reconstruct and bring back together um, the community of Christians in North Africa. And I think that's a very important uh, dimension of uh, what's going on in Augustine's world that we often miss. Another one is that, um, and this is one that Augustine, I think, was actually in, on the losing side. Um, the shape of what it meant to be a bishop and what a bishop's thought was in the fourth century was very much changing. Um, it seems to me that, in fact, the presentation that Augustine offered of himself in the Confessions, but then in many other places, uh, of a far too human character, uh, was quite, quite countercultural in terms of both traditional pictures of authority and also um, pictures of the emerging ecclesiastical authority of Augustine's day. So Augustine is actually speaking in some ways in uh, cringe-making uh, ways, and we can see this if you if you teach the undergraduates to confession, uh, if you teach the confessions to undergraduates today, you see this all the time. They they're still achieved out a little bit by some of the stuff that Augustine will say. Um, not just in the Confessions, but even in the City of God. Um, and so he's, um, he's actually in some ways playing with pictures of authority there in ways that the rest of the church is moving in very different ways. Chuck, um, can I just ask um, to become more sort of open and personal or less? In which direction were they moving? I would, I would argue, I think this is not super controversial, um, that by and large, the picture of authority that bishops assumed they needed to have was growing more and more marble-like, more and more unquestionable, and more and more authoritative um, over the course of the fourth century, more distant from the rest of their communities, and more decisively about determining orthodoxy. There were huge fights, especially in the Greek East. Uh, the orthodoxy wars of the fourth century were, were ginormous. I think that's a Latin word. And um, Augustine actually was involved in his own orthodoxy fights, but, but undertook them in, and tried to um, organize his churches in such a way that there was a lot more, um, it seems to me anyway, a lot more give. If you compare Augustine to someone like Athanasius, let me tell you, you'd rather be in a faculty meeting with Augustine than Athanasius, okay? I'll just, or, you know, to buy a used car from Augustine rather than Athanasius. Athanasius would find monks to beat you up. Um, so that's the second one, this kind of larger change in the church. A third one, which is emerging and actually touches on Augustine in the Pelagian controversy is the emergence of a very, very powerful monastic movement. Um, now the monastic movement in Christianity is a response to, and in some ways, a response to the success of Christianity in the Constantinian empire. Um, what's gonna happen to showing who the real Christians are, right? Before we had martyrs, we knew who were the real Christians because they were gonna suffer and die. 
after Constantine, it gets harder to prove that. Um, and the monastic movement is one of the ways in which there still attempts to be a reification of a divide between the true Christians and the false Christians. Augustine, of course, plays with this all the time. In some way, he wants to say everybody is a false Christian, um, but we're all trying to be true Christians. Um, that's his conception in some ways of the church. And uh, ironically, though, I think, again, here, Augustine, in some ways, loses that fight in the early Middle Ages. Uh, the later uh, absorption of Augustine was largely by a monastic audience, not by the kind of audience that Augustine himself uh, expected. And this comes to my last transition. Um, and this is a transition that's in some ways after Augustine. Remember always that Augustine was a rhetor. He was a professor um, of rhetoric, but that means much more than just rhetoric. It means public speaking and in some ways training people to be public intellectuals. Um, the nature of the rhetor in Augustine's world was the person who trained people to be full citizens and participants in the public life of uh, the ancient empire. Uh, and in some ways, the ancient empire had a rich and vibrant public life. What is interesting about uh, Augustine's world is that the educational structures that created a kind of uh, literate Latin uh, laity who would read a book like The City of God and appreciate it, and sometimes offer, as we have letters from some of these audience members, sometimes offer Augustine criticisms of his, uh, of his arguments and stuff like that, and other times offer vague appreciations of the sort that you know we will occasionally get on email and stuff like that. Um, that kind of audience disappears within about a century of Augustine's uh, writing. And so in the very first sentence of The City of God, he says, I'm writing this as a response to you, Marcellinus, right? Now, Marcellinus is not a priest. He is an authority in the Roman Empire. It's a complicated kind of authority, too. We could talk about that later. He was a tragic figure in some ways. But he was a layman. He was not a member of the religious, um, the separate religious authority structure. And it seems to me very important that one of the biggest transitions uh, of Augustine's world is that the very audience to which he meant to write um, actually disappeared within about a century after his putting, uh, if not pen to paper, at least uh, beginning to in, in tell his scribes to put pen to paper. Um, and for about a thousand years after him, he did not have much in the way of a lay audience. He was mostly heard, read, and listened to, and digested, and appropriated by monks and ecclesiastics. And I think that's actually a very important thing to realize, um, that we've lost something of what Augustine was trying to do, precisely because the audience he meant to do it with disappeared almost right away. That's all I'd say. Yeah, that's great. Um, Eric or Veronica, if you have anything you'd like to add. I do, I do want to come back to the, the church upheaval and, and schisms. I think that's really interesting. And on sort of multiple fronts, you're sort of getting these huge Changes within the church uh, at the time, um, but maybe we'll start with. Could, could I just add one one thing here, Travis? Yes, please. Because I think um, Peter Brown, um, you know, a very prominent historical scholar of Augustine, um, also emphasized that one of the things Augustine does in his day, and this I think has to do with some social upheavals. Remember, there's there's waves of migration. There's religious violence that Chuck mentioned. Um, but there's also just incredible poverty. Um, and one of the things Augustine does, Peter Brown argues, is invent the very notion of the poor. And in doing so, um, displaces the priority of citizen and non-citizen and makes the imagination for caring for the poor so central to the Christian church. I think that dovetails with some of the things that, that Chuck was saying about the monastic movement maybe, but I, I just think that it, it's important to remember, you know, this is a, a world that smells often of death. I mean, there's, there's no refrigeration, infant mortality rates are incredible. Um, and I think Augustine, the, the pastor, is uh, this focus on poverty is, is very important. I know we're gonna come to some contemporary issues, but, but also as, as Chuck mentioned, he was a culture warrior. Uh, he was uneasy, I think, about this new world order um, and his polemics some, sometimes bear all the marks of identity politics and, and shaming that travels with the politics of confession. He didn't wanna give an inch to some of his opponents. Um, 
And, and Chuck mentioned the fall of Rome. I mean, we, we may get back to this. Sometimes I tell undergraduates, it's like 9-11 times 10,000 in the cultural imagination, the loss of a cultural ideal. Um, and Christians were distraught as much as pagans. And, and Augustine, I think, initially thought that God was doing a great thing through the empire, but came to think otherwise and, and sort of said to Christians, don't sweat the small stuff like the fall of Rome. <laughs> you know, um, uh, there's historians are debating this now. There was an interesting article that just came out uh, in the Journal of Roman Studies that uh, not much happened, 410 and all that, um, that sort of for three days, Alaric came in and there was a couple, I, uh, I think Veronica has recently written about this in relation to the Capitol. Um, but uh, in, in, in one sense, uh, it was sensationalized. In another sense, it was a, a dramatic cultural transformation. And, and, and I'm sure we'll get into that, what it means for Augustine's views on politics and history and empire later on. But, um, you know, I don't want to displace 410, um, but uh, just to also realize there's a lot going on in this world that, that many people find helpful for our world. And getting back briefly to what I said, I, if you look at the mid 20th century, a lot of the refugees who came to American universities, if you think of um, Kantorowitz, Arendt, Auerbach, they were all deeply shaped by an education in Augustine. Um, uh, you know, many of them wrote dissertations on Augustine, maybe not sharing certainly his Christian commitments, but they found his problematics and what he worried about to be informative for their own social upheavals in, in the mid 20th century. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could expound, Eric, on the, the culture wars he was a part of. Um, that's really interesting to me uh, and maybe maybe worth, you know, chatting about. Well, I, I think there were many, you know, Chuck pointed to the internal culture wars. Remember, I think sometimes for a long time, we just thought of Augustine's church as the majority religion, uh, when in fact, the Donatists were the majority religion in, in his time. Um, that was soon to, to change. Um, and the, there's, I think it's important to always uh, kind of keep the Donatist controversy in mind in, in reading Augustine's text. Though the city of God is, is often presented as Augustine's response to the culture war with the pagans. Um, the pagans said, um, you Christians were worshiping the wrong God or, uh, or um, the wrong gods, namely one God that you're too uptight about and that is meek and mild and doesn't support the civil religion of Rome. And you failed to keep up uh, the empire. Um, but Augustine, you know, turns turns the story around and says, no, you made the empire your religion. Let's look at your empire. And it's full of injustice. It's full of violence. And, you know, he, he invites them in book three to um, let the crimes be seen naked. And this is why Augustine is sometimes seen as like the first ideology critique, um, the first unmasking of the history tellers of Rome. Now, Roman historians had for a long time done similar things, but I think that kind of, that's what I meant by the, the culture war, the way in which Augustine is kind of trying to narrate the great temptation of politics being idolatry, um, thinking you can transcend politics and identify it directly with God's purposes. Um, but I don't think he thought Rome was evil all the way down. Um, given, you know, some of his metaphysical views uh, that on the nature of God's goods creation, I think it would be harm hard for him to say that. And he talks a lot about the imperfect virtue, the imperfect peace, the, the imperfect um, laws that reveal the order of, of nature. So um, he didn't want to baptize Rome, but he didn't want to condemn it as evil. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that that kind of balance is at his best, uh, the way he approaches culture wars. Yeah. Veronica, that, I mean, so what Eric is saying reminds me a little bit about the piece that you wrote, uh, Timely Lessons from the Sack of Rome, which kind of spoke into some political divisions in our own time, um, thinking with Augustine about those. And you, you talk about his sort of uh, intervention into a toxic political culture of his time. I wonder if, if you could sort of expound upon that and, and um, talk about the way he engaged that project. Sure. Yeah, so a friend had sent me an email asking, what did I think about the parallels, I think, uh, my friend noticed that a person was dressed like a barbarian and so thought that perhaps it was like this, the sack of Rome. And so um, that's kind of what led to writing this in the first place. And I was really more interested in drawing out the, rather than the like analyzing the immediate, um, inter what happened to the capital, rather the cultural context. And that's where we see the similarity with what Augustine is dealing with in the city of God really. And, um, and what we see today. So 
Yeah, what I found interesting in terms of a parallel was, um, yeah, so uh, Eric was mentioning there was this kind of antipathy. One of the, the famous phrases was, it rains, blame the Christians. So there was this real kind of animosity um, going on, and, and, and that was the birth, in a certain sense, of the city of God, this idea of, I'm going to defend Christianity and show that perhaps the reasons why Rome is in the situation it is, is a lot more complicated um, than it might appear at first. And yeah, so I mentioned a toxic political culture. I think the what I was trying to draw out was the way that Augustine shows that there, there are just deep roots of um, letting hatreds fester in Rome and uh, letting myth um, grow and metastasize in Rome in ways that are viewed as politically useful, um, but then also foster these forms of nostalgia. Um, you know, Rome has never been in such a bad position as it is now. And um, so who is to blame kind of becoming the question. And I thought that, you know, uh, that is that doesn't seem so unfamiliar. Um, this 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 culture where entertainment and politics and religion, the boundary between all of those things is very blurred in a way that is quite unhealthy. Um, uh, so that those are the kind of themes that I was trying to draw in connecting um, what Augustine has to say in the City of God with, I think perhaps the situation that we were seeing in January as it was unfolding, what was behind it. It's really great. Um, yeah, and for those of you who haven't read it, uh, maybe we could drop a, a link at some point before the end of the, the program. It's a really nice piece. Um, so we've mentioned a couple times the, the the sack of Rome, and it you know may or may not have been a, a very important historical event, but maybe culturally in the time, in the cultural imaginary, it, it certainly was a uh, loomed large. Um, and it loomed large for Augustine, um, and some of you have written about that. And it kind of gives us the starting point for this, this conversation on what I've called providence and history in the city of God, sort of thinking about the way in which Augustine was a theological interpreter of reality and of his times, and thinking about the way in which that event changed his understanding of, of both providence and history um, and, our, and our knowledge of them. Um, so this is a question for all the, all the panelists or any of the panelists, but um, you know, how did that huge political transition change his sort of theological imaginary about how God relates to the world and how, how we relate to the political order? I think the transition had really already started taking place. I think maybe in the young Augustine, you have perhaps a, an idea of Christian triumphalism in the sense that, oh, look how providential it is that Constantine converted, right? And now uh, God is going to use this empire to sow Christianity across the world and uh, we have a golden future ahead of us. But it, it's before the sack of 410 that he does start talking about the world in this negative sense. And I think it is, part of it comes from his meditation on scripture, really, um, that he sees uh, that the hopes that perhaps someone like Eusebius or Lactantius or Rosius are placing in the Christian emperor are misplaced. Um, and we really need to step back and reorient ourselves um, both for the sake of the political world in which we are, but also for the sake of our souls um, and, yeah, our futures, I guess you would put it. Um, so the transition had already started to occur, but certainly after 410, um, there is in his sermons um, much more of an emphasis on this, I think in part because he's ministering to a people who are very destabilized. You know, they're watching, as Eric mentioned, um, people are flooding into North Africa with these horror stories of what took place. Um, Rome, I mean, you can read Jerome's letters, right, where he is lamenting this as like the end of the world. Um, that where will stability be found, says Jerome. And I think Augustine has a, a has a real response to Jerome on this. Um, and that's something that he's also uh, concerned for his parishioners who are sort of on the fence, like, this isn't what we thought. We didn't, this isn't what we thought the Christian era was going to be like. 
we thought that um, the incarnation and you know the destruction of the idols, all of this was an upward trajectory. And that's not what it seems to mean. And I think Augustine is really trying to help both his parishioners and maybe also himself kind of interpret the muddiness of history um, with hope. I would, I would just add, um, there's a, uh, I agree with what Veronica just said. Um, there's a convenient analogy in our own world to those of us who are old and cranky on this, on this Zoom call. Um, those of us who were alive in the 90s um, and thought about um, Fukuyama's end of history thesis and were intrigued by that, um, it does, it's, it's, it's always dangerous to make these cheap comparisons, but there's a way in which a kind of Eusebian triumphalism is a little bit analogous to some of the feelings of the confidence of neoliberalism in the 1990s in the United States. Um, and uh, that can idea- you just explain, Can you just explain what Fukuyama was mean, meant by that term? For like people like you who were toddlers in the 90s? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's, it's actually, I think Fukuyama is a much deeper thinker than he's often caricatured as, and I think he's quite brilliant on this. So I think it's deeper, but nonetheless, lots of people thought um, uh, that uh, with the end of the Soviet Union, there was in some ways a kind of universal consensus uh, that ideology had settled uh, on a broadly liberal democratic capitalism. Uh, and that's the idea. It's not, that's actually not fair to Fukuyama, but that, and, and, and in a way, um, there are lots of people out there. One of my favorite poets, Czechoslav Mivos, wrote a wonderful poem called A Poem for the End of the Century, which was in very many ways a very Augustinian poem, sort of saying, I don't think this is smart to think this way, guys. Um, I think Augustine was also very disquieted by this, perhaps not in his 20s, I think Veronica's totally right, but by the time he begins to encounter the complexity of his own world, he realizes that the kinds of confidences of fourth century imperial Roman systems are not necessarily gonna do it for all of us. There is one big difference between Augustine's um, world and ours, it, it seems to me, at least a little bit, and that is, um, that we have tumult within the system, which is more like a civil war. Um, but apart from a few moments for a few of us where we were deeply anxious about whether or not Donald Trump might actually overthrow the political system uh, of the US, um, we haven't actually faced the idea that that system as a whole might come to an end. An important difference between the Roman Empire and us is that most of the countries in our world have borders the Roman Empire had frontiers and it did not really think, and Augustine doesn't really think much about the people beyond those borders as bearing some significant uh, humanity in common uh, with the people inside. And it's not to say that he thought they were less creatures, lesser creatures, but the idea of the nature of the Imperium, it's not quite a state in the way that a modern would think of a state as a territorially um, limited thing. The Imperium was in some ways a little bit more like civilization itself. Um, and so for Augustine, um, the challenge of thinking beyond the empire was in some ways more existentially wrenching um, than say someone thinking beyond the limits of their own political, political state today, in some ways, I would say. So let me ask a, a follow-up question um, about about the empire uh, and about sort of the, the notion of, um, I guess, Veronica, you just mentioned hope. So, you know, in some sense, you know, maybe there's a shift in Augustine's time or in his thinking of placing hope, you know, in the empire versus apart from the empire. Maybe we'd say something like that. Um, there's, a, there's a quotation that I want to read just to, to tee us up uh, in, in the city of God, he says, as for this mortal life, which ends in a few days course, what does it matter under whose rule a man lives, being so soon to die, provided that the rules do not force him to impious and wicked acts? Seems to me that, you know, maybe if you take this quote on the face of it, that Augustine becomes something of a, uh, maybe a quietist or, or some, um, you know, a separatist thinker who, who isn't really interested in what forms of government we live under. Um, but he was a bishop and he was counseling people who were in authority throughout his career. I wonder if that's a fair description of him. So how did he think about political order and how to engage it as Christians in a time of upheaval? Mm -hmm. 
Okay, uh, so it seems like, well, I would first of all say that yes, this idea of Augustine as a rhetorician is a really important place to start because to take this out of context uh, can be misleading. Um, he's making a particular point in this place. You can pull out other quotes from Augustine elsewhere where he says there's nothing better for civilization or nothing more fortunate for human affairs than by the mercy of God, good leaders should rule far and wide and long, serving God with true rights and good morals, right? So uh, that's a very different picture, right? This idea that it's, I hope for and I wish for a good leader for any community. Um, he also says that it's better to have leaders with imperfect virtue than no virtue at all. He says that we should celebrate when um, a just, the just side in a war wins. And he says that peace is good, justice is good, all these things are gifts from God, right? Um, breaking news <laughs> from Chuck. Um, anyways, so it's not that he's disinterested, it's that he wants to pull us from a myopic focus on the here and now. Uh, he thinks that the, my, the myopia of our focus actually makes life worse here and now. It, it causes us to engage badly with the here and now because we lack the context. Um, and then also, as I mentioned, the hope that we could draw on to engage well in service um, in our world that is broken. Uh, so yes, he's not an institutional thinker. He's not primarily interested in what forms of government um, are the best. Certainly the city of God is this, the community of love, right? So in that way, it sort of serves as, as the standard against, we against which we measure anything else. That's true. Um, but he primarily thinks about uh, communities and how can we engage in those communities in a way that is uh, healing, and that's the way to, to be a pilgrim who seeks to serve. Um, so it's not that he, he is so disinterested in politics. That is one rhetorical turn of phrase that he's using for a particular purpose. Um, I don't know if that answers your question or not. I was gonna, I could jump, or Chuck, were you gonna? Just go ahead, Eric, I'll go after you. Well, I was gonna just- We, we all back, have but... a lot to share. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I was going to come back to actually, um, there's there's a revealing sermon that I think the first sermon Augustine preached after the sack of Rome, which I've taught with undergrads. Uh, I'm not a preacher. Um, it has perhaps, you know, it shows, I think, Augustine's sensibilities in that moment. It, it has a little bit of Pat Robertson in it that suffering is for your own good. This is a part of your own training and virtue. The providence of God is chastening us. Uh, maybe like Job's friends. Um, so there's a moment where, where Augustine is always, I think, balancing pastorally between those who need hope, because, uh, you know, as Howard Thurman, you know, for those with their backs against the wall, and those who might need a little bit of despair, because they're so prideful about their possibilities and what they're able to do. And I think that that sermon may not be Augustine at his best, but I, I think it does kind of play into some of the reception that um, the world will break your heart. Politics is not going to save us. The world is too vulnerable. Um, happiness is only a promise in this world. Uh, it's we live on hell on earth, as he says in the city of God. So maybe we should be indifferent to politics, to economics. Um, we're exiles in a penal colony. Um, and, and I think particularly the evangelical tradition has often picked this up in some ways that we mourn, we pray, we wait. God is sort of working, um, working on history, not us. Okay, um, and so there's a kind of ambivalence. Um, there's a there's a soberness. At the same time, uh, other Augustinians have gone the other way. That look, life is tragic, so we must take responsibility for history, and we must um, um, maybe not think our Christian convictions can could guide us, but we kind of lamentedly live in a world where we need to do evil to achieve good or, or what have you. Um, and we can despair it um, and ask for forgiveness. Um, so Augustine's writings, I think, do take us into hell, but I think they always do so in order to get us out, kind of, kind of like Lincoln or Milton or, or others. Um, I think a lot of the lessons of, of Augustinian realism, we, we learned too well. And I think for our generation, a lot of it is, is thinking about the possibilities of politics in an Augustinian vein, um, without denying the kind of concerns Augustine had about 
too much enthusiasm for, for our power to bring in the kingdom of God. Um, I, I think um, one of the great questions for Christians today is what's the relationship between um, our earthly happiness and the ultimate form of happiness we will have with God in eternity? And um, there's concerns about the Augustinian traditions kind of draining history of any real relation to God because it's just one thing after another. Um, so we have to think about, well, what is divine providence? What is our relationship to it? Is there any way to think about the civil rights movement as a part of um, church history, of getting right with God? And, and how to think about the relationship between salvation history and political history. Now, these are, you know, complicated questions, um, but, you know, I think this is just facing us in new ways, but Christians have thought about this uh, in, in all sorts of different contexts, in South Africa and um, a, a what have you. And Augustine did, you know, he did write letters to public officials to try and secure better conditions. Um, famously, he thought slavery was permissible. You know, he got slavery wrong to our mind. Um, he thought the slave trade was wicked. And maybe we have to think about, well, in his own context and the kinds of debates we're having today all over the place. But I think there, there is a way in which um, we can see Augustine did think that the kingdom of God was the destiny of all history. And, and so, so it's not just about the church. And there's analogies between divine and human action between what he called the res publica, the public thing, and what God was doing in history. It may not be legible to us completely, but, but I think the kind of separation and the kind of inward quietism that you mentioned um, at the end of the day um, doesn't match Augustine's practice or his theology. Yeah, that's great. Chuck, did you wanna jump in there? Yeah, just a couple quick things. Uh, uh, Eric and I, um, I think Eric and I and Veronica all agree on the basic thrust of Augustine in terms of engaging in public life and in life in the world. I think that's true. I think Eric and I both might be of a slightly older generation than Veronica. Um, and we both might be thinking, I, th I think Eric, some of what you said about we need more energy to care about politics. I actually think today, the youth today um, are in fact, um, if anything, much more on the opposite side. Uh, it seems to me that there's much more of an expectation of bringing morality and politics much too much more closely together. Um, whereas I think maybe in the 90s, you know, us in our flannel, we were much more embittered and cynical. Um, I feel like a lot of the protests today are actually much more um, about bringing together um, uh, the kingdom of the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of earth. Um, so just put that out there that there might be a tension in our, our generational experiences. The other thing I would say is that there are two really interesting moments in the city. I, I just I'm, I, I can't help but go to the text in a little bit because it's kind of groovy to do this um, that are really great on this that I love with my students. The famous moment in book five, it's chapter 24, where Augustine talks about what kind of happiness is available for a Christian who is properly involved in politics, especially a Christian emperor. Right. So he uses the example of Theodosius who's kind of the paradigmatic emperor of Augustine's, um, of Augustine's youth, um, the, great, the great savior of the empire after the disaster of Adrianople and stuff. And he says there in this fantastic line that every undergraduate in my, my classes and maybe um, some grad students might have to chew over, he says, the only kind of happiness Christians can have is happiness in hope. And what exactly is that happiness? That's a wonderful moment to think about what, what kind of happiness is Augustine offering? especially at the end of those first five books, which are all about the possibilities of happiness on this, on this, in this world. Um, it's a really wonderful moment. The other one is um, one that I know uh, Eric and I have, have actually co-taught together, um, of course, famously 1906, the, the famous moment where um, the question of whether or not the Christian should judge, should engage, be engaged in the judicial practices that are necessary, um, as Augustine reads it, uh, for civic life to go on, especially given the mysteriousness of people's motives and hearts and the, and the final impossibility of knowing of all facts about the truth. And Augustine says, inevitably, um, you have to do this, even though it is painful and, and hard, because you, you, if you don't, um, uh, it is worse to walk away from civic life. But he says, but that does not excuse you from complicity in wickedness. Um, and he says, uh, it's much better for that person to cry out to God with the psalmist, from my necessities, deliver me. Um, and I think those, those two moments, that idea of being happy only in hope, um, 
and um, always knowing that you have to be delivered from your necessities, but not necessarily evading those necessities. Um, those are both really great, I think, texts for people to think about with Augustine on public life. That's really, really great, and really helpful. Can um, I quickly add something? <laughs> Uh, one thing that I think is interesting with Augustine and his role as a bishop, uh, especially to those in, in, in these positions of being a judge, is that he considers it his responsibility to help them be humanistic, um, to be humane in their role. Um, and he, he almost gives them an excuse to be able to, to say, oh, I'm doing this because the bishop is, is, is encouraging me to do this. But he... he uh, he does in other places, I think, complicate the, the depiction of a judge that is so famous in the city of God um, and renders the picture of the Christian judge more deeply in touch with his humanity and the need to judge others with, with deep humanity. That's great. Um, so we have a bunch of great questions I'm, I'm seeing come through. One thing I'd like to, to invite those of you who are watching to do is if you if you put a question in the q a and you would be happy to ask it um to have us uh turn your microphone on and, and have you ask it live in the program um, go ahead and click the raise hand button and if i see that your your hand is raised and and your question is one that we um want to move forward with we'll ask you to to ask it on on camera or whatever zoom this medium is um so Please feel free to do that. Raise your hand if you want to ask your question. Um, the, I'm going to go ahead and, and extra points if you can appear like a cat on the Zoom thing, like that judge or lawyer in Texas did. That would be totally awesome. <laughs> I'm not a cat. I promise. <laughs> yeah. So, um, and uh, just with all events with Anselm House, I'd like to also mention that um, whenever we have public. Um, forums like this, we ask that when you ask your question, you would ask it respectfully, um, that you would ask it briefly, and that you would ask it in the form of a question. So those are the three sort of um, things that we'd, we'd like. And I did see um, Jonathan Tran's hand up, and that was a question that I thought would be worth um, talking about. So if he's, if he's still on here, I might just go ahead and turn on, invite him to ask his question. Am I on? You're on. Oh, <laughs> what's up, y'all? It's great to see you. I'm I'm from Texas. I am a cat, but I'm not a judge. So, um, but I, I love all the people on here. So, hey, I I I was wondering. I, I've been thinking a lot about anti-racism uh, politics. So my question is this: uh, it, Augustine seemed to carry forward Plato's analogy between ordering the city and ordering um, the soul. Uh, in contemporary politics, there's a strong interest, I think Chuck was saying this, is a really strong interest in ordering the city even more than say most recent generations. Um, but there's a seeming disconnect between that and ordering the soul and whether or how one should even do that. So my first question is, is that a correct formulation per Augustine? And second, um, does Augustine think there's a viable politics in that disconnect? Um, and it's, it's really a question of like, if that connect is true, how do we formulate something like anti-racist politics? Um, so I don't know if that question makes sense, but I appreciate y'all's time. I, I think it makes a little sense. Um, uh, I, mean, I mean that in a good way, Jonathan, don't worry. <laughs> um, I, I think in some ways the question is twofold. On the one hand, is, there, um, is this a reasonable assessment of Augustine that he talks about the inner and the outer? The inner order and the outer order in some aligned way. Um, I think we're all pretty, uh, I think, I, I don't want to speak for anyone else, sorry, I think that's a reasonable account of what Augustine is doing, and it connects to all sorts of other stuff in his thinking that we find harder to accept, many of us, um, like a, curtain, a certain kind of um, unproblematic paternalism and stuff like that, and the way that authorities are allowed to police uh, the people beneath them in, in more vigorous ways than maybe we would find comfortable. Um, I would say also, though, that the um, the other flip side of that is the way, and I think I learned this a little bit from from Eric's stuff, uh, that by Augustine putting politics kind of back in its place as not necessarily um, the exhaustive locus of soul formation, um, Augustine has deflated uh, 
uh, the expectations of what we can find in politics to some degree in a way that anticipates some of the ways that later we would call liberal thinkers. This is not to say Augustine is a liberal, right? Um, but we could later say liberal thinkers have followed up on that in some ways, if the full human good is not immediately to be sought in the material ordering of civil society, um, then uh, that puts a little more interesting dynamic tension and uh, potentially conflict um, in the relationing uh, between the self, um, God, and the society that we find ourselves in. Not sure if that all made sense, but that's what I was thinking. I, I mean, I, can I jump in real quick on this? I, I think um, one, another kind of cartoonish uh, contrast, getting back to the crossroads where Augustine stands, is that ancient politics was about promoting virtue, and modern politics is about uh, expanding liberty. And in a sense, I think Augustine is there at the crossroads as well. Um, his sense is God, only God can transform us, but that too much liberty causes problems. <laughs> and we need laws and institutions that can kind of channel our restless energies. Um, and he wanted to nurture various ins institutions and associations that could contribute to uh, maybe what we call neighborliness. Um, so he didn't want to evacuate politics of morality. Um, and as I said, he wrote these letters to encourage people to do. But generally, it's a cautious moderation that activists have never found Augustine, you know, that appealing. One of my, my favorite disturbing quotes was um, abolitionist Catherine Beecher, um, the elder sister to Harriet Beecher Stowe. She said that um, we must combat the Anglo-Saxon enslavement of African bodies. But we must also, referring to Augustine, combat the African enslavement of the Anglo-Saxon mind, meaning that we had interpreted through Calvinism a kind of despairingness about, um, you know, and I think this gets to Jonathan's question. One of the things I think we should be thinking a lot about that's really hard to do is Augustine also famously talks about original sin, um, the kind of power of sin in our world that transcends individuals and we talk about structural injustice or social sin. And I think the relationship between collective responsibility for that, this, this sense of large scale wrongs that exceed individual moral agents, I think an Augustinian has things to say about that, um, that the kind of haunting presence of the past and, and how to um, kind of live with that. And I think one of the things I've always appreciated about Augustine is that it's so different. He has a very personal approach to politics. It's about relationships. Um, you know, he's not a, he didn't go to a public policy school. He didn't go to the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. Um, and, and that he, he always, he, I think in some of the uh, footnotes to City of God, he says, it'd be better if we lived in small republics, right? Um, that personal dimension has limits. Um, and, and sometimes it, 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 you know, in a different age, maybe he could imagine other initiatives. But I think in some ways what some people are doing with like organizing on local communities and anti-racist initiatives kind of gets to some aspect of this Augustinian personalism, even as at the same time we might be doing both at a kind of bigger policy institutional level. I mean, I think the whole question of Augustine and race is something that Augustine scholars haven't done much with. Uh, I've been tempted to write an article on how Augustine became white, like, um, and, and this gets into bigger conversations about theology today. Um, but it's interesting, this kind of what, what Augustine thought, at, was he a cosmopolitan intellectual who thought what mattered was grace, not race, to borrow from a controversial formulation of N.T. Wright? Or did he think that God saves peoples, not individuals? And he certainly thought about that about the nation of Israel. Um, and so how do we think about race in Augustine's time? I mean, he's a Berber. He complains about people making fun of him because of his accent when he goes to Italy. So he experienced, I mean, the kind of the role of ethnicity, let's call it, and race making. I don't think Augustine scholars have done as much with a, as they could. Obviously, in biblical studies, and I think in medieval studies, there's been a turn to that. But maybe, I know there's a book coming out by a very distinguished Augustine scholar, Augustine the African, that will get at some of this. Um, but I, I think in terms of like, I, maybe Chuck and I disagree about the current generation, but at least my students, they're not idealistic. Um, they kind of maybe, they don't 
don't imagine the end of history. They're kind of more, we can reduce suffering, um, but they're worried what's going to happen today in Minnesota. There's, we might call it Augustine in conversation with Afro-pessimism without, with a sense of, um, you know, America being stained um, and, and not able to um, raise to its better nature, what have you. So I think all of these things, different Augustinian moments, uh, you know, is Martin Luther King Jr. the great Augustinian of America? Um, because he tried to historicize, not just psychologize injustice. Um, and this vision of a beloved community, I think it has deep Augustinian resonance uh, for him. So, but it's, but he also thought um, changing the law was important, not just being nice and merciful. So Eric, I would just add that um, we, we might disagree here. I, I think that people, the kids today, the, the, the youth today, um, they, they may not be idealistic in the sense of being optimistic, but the expectation um, that morality ought to be the standard form of politics um, strikes me as uh, powerfully mobilizing and powerfully energizing, uh, but also possibly down the road a little bit, um, potentially constructing for them uh, a little ambush that they might find difficult. So I've 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 found recent the the wonderful little piece by the woman who wrote um, uh, I was the author of uh, Your Fave is Problematic is a, is a really nice piece that there's a number of people who are now thinking maybe the earlier kind of energy to um, you know identify everything that is wrong with everybody else um, is maybe not as healthy as we as we thought and um, you know the line in Augustine that I always love in moments like that is that uh, and I think it's in it's in the city that um, in this life, justice is more about the forgiveness of sins than the realization of virtues. Um, he doesn't deny- I think Augustine but, mitigates blame, but still holds people accountable. Absolutely. Uh, the question so is- Confession, lament, repair. Yeah. And how do you relate those things? That I think is the diff He's not a juridical, I think, thinker. Um, and that's the question. He's a, he's a, he's a thinker about redemption. Uh, but I think also he's, he's very nervous uh, about our temptations towards, um, you know, opposing the other and destroying them in some way. Yes. Yeah, he certainly is really con uh, He's concerned about that. I think one place that's very striking is his use of uh, the image of the woman caught in adultery uh, as a reminder and, and, and the way that people judged her as a reminder that all of us after Christ are in a position of being forgiven. And that is the basis for interacting with others. I mean, so I, I do I do think that Augustine, especially in the first book of the City of God, is really good on pointing out how a culture that wants to be moral can very quickly fall into pride and judgmentalism of others. Um, he, I mean, obviously his treatment of the rape victims in, in the sack of Rome, that's where that comes out really strongly, uh, this, this need to not have any kind of culture that wants to be moral is going to end up being harsh if this is rooted in pride rather than love. And that's always a temptation for the human condition. When we want to make things better, um, we, we separate the pure from the impure. And humility has to start from a recognition that we have received something gratuitously, love gratuitously, and that I think recalling each one of us to that for him is the starting point of the possibility of engaging in anything like real cultural renewal because any cultural renewal that is simply um i mean speaking speaking to rome and the sack like um who's to blame uh he's constantly calling us back to ourselves um and yes to our sin but also to the fact that we've been loved and forgiven um and that's very important for an Augustinian vision, I think. Can I just say one more quick thing about that, about just playing up on something Rebecca, just, sorry, that uh, Veronica just said um, uh, about um, the bringing us back to ourselves. Uh, and this connects also to the earlier thing about rhetoric. Um, the very, I mean, I, 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 if people, you guys might know this, I play this up a lot. Um, look, the use of the word city in the title and the very, first word of the of the book, gloriosissimum, this, this idea of most glorious. These are both kind of 
classically pagan Roman words. And what's amazing about Augustine is that he's not asking you to throw out your entire received vocabulary and install a new one. This is not like you know replacing Windows with some other, uh, some other operating system. He wants to say that the language we have, that we have inherited, is flawed, is bent, is distorted, but it still is potentially redeemable. The language and the flesh we have are the things that are going to be redeemed by God. That will be painful and hard for us, but that's the way that God has chosen, right? God is not replacing this world with a new one, right? And so in that way, for Augustine, it's very important, the rhetorical shape of the city, the way so much of it is about the transformation of language, um, and so much of it is etymological, like that's really central to what Augustine is actually trying to do. The etymology, the axiology, and the theology all go together for him. Um, so I would just put that out there. I agree. <laughs> so we're, we're, getting, we're getting up on time, and I do want to get a couple more questions in. Um, one that's maybe related to what we talked about, but shifts the terrain a little bit, is about political wisdom um, and providence. And, and uh, the, you know, the, the question is basically, is there a way in which political wisdom might sort of depend upon being able to see what God's doing in history? And I think it is relevant to some of the ways in which people are thinking about um, political wisdom today, oftentimes you hear about being on the right side of history or wrong side of history or being able to see where God is on the move or, you know, some of this sort of language. I wonder, you know, what Augustine might make of that, the mature Augustine, or how we might think with Augustine about, you know, seeing, seeing or being able to point to God's action in history as we try to engage politics well. I think for the reasons that we've already mentioned, this sort of recognition that uh, history wasn't what we thought it would be and that it remains muddy and it, things aren't all fixed by uh, here and now by the incarnation in, in the sense of the political being fixed by it. Um, I think that's really important. I also am very struck by uh, the way in which he emphasizes that scripture only tells us what we need in order to um, get to heaven in a certain sense, which sounds very otherworldly and like, well, that's not very helpful, but it's actually an important restraint because I do think it's constantly a temptation to say that we know what God is up to in history. And he points out that we know that God is just and loves justice. Um, we know that God is merciful. Um, but there's a restraint to his argument that I think is fitting and important because it's also related to our own humility um, or our need to grow in humility. Um, in, and so perhaps there's a certain way in which political wisdom recognizes that, yes, we have to, to act in a spirit of service. Um, yes, we, we seek to make our community um, more whole and more heal, healed. Um, but at the same time, uh, perhaps to have a little bit of, um, yeah, humility. Eric, you want to jump in? Yeah, I just, I think that Augustinian humility is, is, is frequently been recruited uh, rightly, often in the face of uh, what I'll just uh, caricature as like spooky Hegelianism, that within political history, God is realizing God's self. So the Augustinian is uh, wary of that. But uh, maybe as it was hinting at, um, I think there can be a, a, an over wariness that postpones all divine activity to beyond history like the real stuff that's what the bible's about and that's what we'll learn about when we get to heaven and so history is this void mm -hmm. and there are passages in augustine that sound like that mainly because there's passages in the bible that sound like that so the question is how we think theologically about this and you know typically augustine is not an apocalyptic thinker where there's an inbreaking except for in the cross and the resurrection and the history of israel but uh, an eschatological patience, a deferral. At the same time, though, I think there are places where we might read into him anachronistically something like secular parables that Karl Barth talked about. Mm -hmm. As Veronica just mentioned, when there is justice, when there is the rule of law, when there is the expansion of charity. Now, we should be distrustful of our capacity to, to do that, especially when we think we are the agents of that in history we maybe can learn more from um, 
others uh, who might be able to identify those things, intimations, hints, uh, places where, you know, we're not necessarily God is on our side, but God is on this side and we want to work together. Uh, I mean, I was thinking there was a question about Reinhold Niebuhr in the chat. You know, he famously talked about equality of sin, but inequality of guilt. And, and I've always wondered, like, what would Augustine have said about that? Um, because he certainly was on the equality of sin side. Um, but that inequality of guilt is a, is a kind of route into making political judgments. And so humility shouldn't paralyze us from making judgments uh, uh, about the difference between justice and its semblances, because that's what Augustine does all through the city of God. He's not interpreting the New York Times every day to decide where God is or where the Holy Spirit is. But the general thrust certainly is divine activity is happening all around us. And it might be in places we don't suspect. The Holy Spirit is at work in the promotion of virtue in unrecognized, not big um, names, not big political histories, surely. But at the same time, I think there has to be a way in which we, we at least, you know, we don't have a criteria that crank this out. Um, but we, I think, theologically demand for, from Augustine's account of history, uh, which, again, he unfolds through a kind of biblical narrative. Um, but it, it's not as if it then leapfrogs, as Chuck was talking about, to the destruction of creation with a new creation. Uh, so again, I'm bringing in my own, you know, I, I don't think Augustine is right about the sacraments. But I think this is similar to what we might call a sacramental view of, of reality, and that we should refer temporal things to their eternal destiny. But it doesn't mean that there's a kind of discontinuity um, between what's important now and what really matters. Chuck, we have one more minute. So last last word. Uh, that language of reference that uh, uh, Eric just used is, is really central here because that's one of the things that this world is meant to be revealing the larger meanings of God for all of us. Um, and in that way, uh, there's a great moment in the city, I think late in the city where he says, uh, maybe it's an 11 actually, but he's talking about uh, miracles and whether or not there are miracles. And he says, yes, there may be miracles. Later, he's much more positive about this, but he says, but the really crucial thing is you have to realize that existence itself is a miracle. And you have to be able to see that creation is already the great word of God in that way. And that, that, and that, that is, is a central thing for what Augustine is trying to get across to us, that this world matters it means it's significant and it's fundamentally good, right? Um, and in that way, it's very incarnational. So I agree with Eric that it's sacramental, even though he he's before the technical languages that we get in the medievals of sacraments in that way. Um, but but he's also very deeply incarnational as a theologian. That's like the Chesterton poem, I will not hang myself today because of it. <laughs> I want to thank all of our panelists, um, Veronica, Eric, and Chuck for um, talking with us. I honestly could do this for hours and wish that we could go through all the questions. Thank you all, all the people who've joined us. Um, we'll go ahead and have this video on online so you can um, reference it, share it with your friends. Um, but uh, thank you for your time today and we really appreciate it. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Veronica. Thank you very much. It was wonderful. Be well and, and all the best for your work with Anselm House. Yeah, thank you, Eric. Thank you.